Well, turn your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 4, as we will continue our study of this letter written by the Apostle Paul to this church in Galatia. We're going to look at verses 21 through 31, the second part of chapter 4. Please listen as I read the words of the living God. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Father in heaven, send your spirit into this place. Fill us with him. Teach us of our freedom in Christ. And show us yet again what it means to be free of the condemnation of the law, the enslavement of the law. And remind us what it is to be sons of the living God through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I've been reading... This past week, a book by the writer of the Dilbert cartoon strip. Anybody read Dilbert? Some of you business folks probably love Dilbert. I'm not in that kind of business, so I don't care that much about Dilbert. But I'm fascinated by this book. Turns out not only is he a cartoonist, but he is a trained hypnotist. And he has spent a lot of his life studying the, the art of persuasion. And the reason I started reading the book is I was intrigued. He predicted President Trump's victory by a landslide a year before the election. And this book walks through why he was so certain that Trump was going to win by such a landslide. And it all has to do with uh, persuasion. He says Trump is the most persuasive man he has ever seen. And he's, uh, this guy's not a conservative, by the way. He says liberals are too conservative for him. So he's not a, he's not a Trump supporter. He's just saying, as I watch how per, uh, persuasion works, Trump has it more than anybody he's ever seen. And in this book, as he's describing how persuasion works, he says we all have something that, that's called confirmation bias. That is, we have our worldview, we have our conclusions, we have uh, the way we see things, and then we interpret what we see and hear based on that bias, and we interpret the evidence to confirm our, our conclusions. And he, he talks about, this book just came out a couple weeks ago, so he's talking about even in this first year of, of Trump's uh, presidency, how it, it's like there are two movies showing on the same screen. When Trump says or does something, you have half the country that interpret that and say, we knew it, he's a white supremacist, he's a bigot, he's a, he's a sexist, he's a whatever, and the other half of the country saying, he's the best thing since Lincoln, he's awesome, he's the greatest, and they're all interpreting the same facts. How is it they can come to such contradictory conclusions? Well, they're biased, and they interpret the data according to that bias. 
Well, we all do this, right? You see what you want to see a lot of times. You hear what you want to hear, and two people can hear the same conversation and come away with very different conclusions about what was being said. Well, the Jews here who have infiltrated, infiltrated Galatia are reading the Old Covenant. They're reading the law with confirmation bias. They're only reading the good parts, all the stuff about God blessing and about us being the children of Abraham. And if you want to be right with God, you've got to become a child of the law of Moses so you can be a child of Abraham and receive all this blessing. And they're not reading the hard parts, the bad parts, if you will. Paul starts off this section with this question to the, to the Galatians. Tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, you who want to follow these Jews and become like them, do you even hear what the law says? Do you read it? Do you listen to the entire thing? Or are you just interpreting what you want to hear? You're only hearing what you want to hear. The, the blessing, everywhere you go, you're going to be blessed. That sounds great. You're going to be blessed in the city. You're going to be blessed in the country. And you're coming in, you're going out, you're going to be blessed. Great. But then there are curses attached to that as well. Do you hear what the law is saying? Or are you just hearing it through this lens? Think about what Paul has already taught about the law in Galatians thus far. He has said the law did not give God's spirit. The Jews, did, I mean, the Galatians did not receive God's spirit through keeping the law. He said that in chapter 3, right? Did you receive the spirit through the, here, the keeping the law? No, you receive the spirit through faith, not through the law. The law doesn't bring the spirit of God. The law did not justify the Jews. The law did not take the Jews and declare them righteous. Didn't do that. Why? Because the law only brought condemnation. Because they were sinners. The Jews broke the law, and all the law could do was pronounce them guilty of transgression. And it did. The law brought cursing, curses for those acts of disobedience. Remember, I think it was, uh, was it Eric over here on the west side that read from Deuteronomy 28 and maybe Leviticus, Leviticus 16 or somewhere about how God was so, it was harsh what God said would happen to the Jews who disobeyed the law. That's what the law did. The law was not based on promise. The law was based on performance. It wasn't God's promise. It was, it was man's performance that brought either justification or condemnation and since they couldn't keep it, it was only condemnation. The law required mediation. Paul makes this point in Galatians 3. There was a mediator between God and man because they were in conflict. The law created that conflict. There had to be a go-between. It was a harsh disciplinarian. That's the pedagogue that we looked at a couple weeks ago. The, the uh, custodian, not in a janitorial sense, but someone who kept somebody in custody. The law kept the Jews in custody and, and wouldn't let them out. It kept them in prison Paul says. They were, it was like a fence around them. They weren't allowed to get out or they'd be treated harshly and rebuked harshly. It kept the Jews underage. We saw this in the first part of chapter 4. They were minors. They were, they were no better than servants. They were underage as long as they were under the law. They weren't full-grown sons who had the right of inheritance. They were underage. That's what the law did to them. And finally, he says it made the Jews slaves. And Paul says, do you even read the law? I mean, why would anybody want to go under that? This is not good news. This is not encouraging. This is, this is not hopeful. This is bad at every level. Why, he says to them, why would you want to be under that law? Don't interpret it just according to a few biases along the way. Read it for what it says. This is the harsh reality of being under the law. Why would you want to do that? So then he tells a story that they would have known. Now, we titled this sermon Fighting Words. Eric came up with that, and I thought it was a good title. Paul here is not picking a fight with the Galatians. He's picking a fight with the Jews in Galatia. And the story he's about to tell, I have no doubt, picked a fight. See, we, we, we forget that things are, were different than they are now. Right now, if, if someone, uh, 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 someone who used to be an elder here wrote a letter to Frack, we could easily disseminate to everybody through email, and you could all read it and think about it and talk about it and that kind of thing. Well, they didn't have that ability 
in this time period. So Paul wrote the letter here, sent it to the Galatians, and these congregations were scattered throughout, throughout the region, and it would be del delivered to one congregation, and the pastor would get up and read it before everybody. And then they would send it on to the next congregation, and they would next Sunday get up and read it before everybody. Now imagine if we're Galatia, and some of you are Gentiles who've come to faith in Jesus, and then the Jews have come in, and they've persuaded a bunch of you that you should submit to the law of Moses, and those Jews are sitting in the congregation, and this letter is read. Already they'd be getting a little hot under the collar, but when this next section was read, I would give anything to have been there to see the smoke coming out of their ears. Paul's about to say the most provocative thing he ever said to the Jews in this next section. And I have no doubt it caused a lot of conflict in the church. And why was he doing this? Because he wanted the Galatians to see the reality of what the Jews were leading them into so they would resist that and stay away from the law of Moses. So we're going to look at this story, and I'm first going to give you the story in its original setting in Genesis, and then we're going to come back and see how Paul walks through it here in Galatians. So uh, the, most of you have been around the church a long time, and you've raised kids in the church, and you, some of you are kids in the church, uh, and you know these stories. So let's just, just re, recall here this, uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. So it begins like this. Now Sarai... Abram's wife had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. Some of you aren't paying attention to me because you want to know where I'm at. It's Genesis 16, so you can go read it later. Just trust me that I know how to read here, okay? Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. Can't help but hearing echoes of Genesis 3, chapter 3 here to me. And Eve listen, or Adam listened to the voice of his wife Eve. And Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan. Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband Abram as his maid. So, I'm going to tell a story, and since some of you... Uh, like picture books. I'm going to give you a little picture book here that I created, okay? So that's Father Abraham. And he's not even Abraham yet. He's just Abram. His name has not been changed. And he has a wife named Sarah. The problem with Sarah is she couldn't get pregnant. She was barren. Now, that was a problem in all the emotional ways and the cultural ways even. It was a bigger deal for a woman not to be able to get pregnant in that culture than it is in our culture. But the really big problem was God had promised Abraham he was going to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, so many of them that they were, it was too high to count. You wouldn't even be able to count that high more than there are stars in the sky. And Sarah didn't even produce one son for Abram. That was a problem. And they're getting old. They're in their 80s and 90s and edging toward 100. And even in that day, this was still old. I mean, my dad is 95 years old. And I read this story about Abraham, and I think, I'm starting to appreciate the miracle of what God did through Abraham and Sarah more and more all the time. Sarah could not bear children. So Sarah decided maybe she could help God out a little bit. Right? Maybe... She'll go through the custom of the day, and she had this, this young Egyptian slave girl, and maybe she could get pregnant by Abraham and have a son, and by law, by custom, that child could be Sarah's, and then she could help God fulfill this promise of having many, many children. So that's what we find at the end of the section that I read, is now he's got a wife, Sarah, and now he's taken Sarah's slave girl as his second wife. So reading on. He went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. <laughs> Love this. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abraham Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what is good in your sight. 
So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Uh, drama, soap opera, all, all in the Bible, even. All right, so Hagar is able to conceive, and she has a son. And she feels like now she's been promoted. She's now above Sarah because she was able to bear a son for Abram. And Sarah doesn't like this one bit. So she treats her poor, harshly and treats the kid harshly and so on. Then we, uh, a few things happen in the next few chapters. God again makes the promises to Abram. He changes his name to Abraham, which means father of nations, and says, you're going to have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. And not through Hagar, but through Sarah. He makes his promise. Then we have this business with Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a pretty dramatic story. Then we have Abraham showing that he hasn't quite become the man of faith that he will become. They go into this area, and he says to Sarah, hey, you are a stunningly good woman. Despite your age, you're a stunningly good woman. The king's going to want you, so just tell him you're my sister. And she did. And God intervenes again so the line would not be corrupt and so on. So that's intermingling here. Well, then we get to chapter 21, and we read this. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, and God ha as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Dwight, you just turned 75 this week. Not too late, brother. Not too late. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. And he said, and she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. So God fulfills his promise. Sarah does get pregnant. She has a son named Isaac. And she says, now about that, other idea I had, uh-uh, send them away. That's, that boy will not be an heir with my son Isaac, okay? So that's the background, that's the story that Paul walks through and uses as an allegory, as an illustration in Galatians for the Galatians. And let's take a look at it here. So back in Galatians chapter 4, verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. All right, we just read that, right? Son by the bondwoman is Ishmael, son by the free woman is Isaac. But the son by the bondwoman was according to the flesh, according to man's work, man's idea not promise, not the spirit, but Sarah and Abraham put this together and decided to do this. The son by the free woman was through the promise, God's promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants. Now, if you were a Jew hearing this being read in the congregation in Galatia or any of the congregations, and you heard... Paul say these women, or these sons, are two covenants, these women, two covenants, you would have scratched your head for a second and said, well, I don't know what covenant he's talking about with Ishmael, but I know what the other covenant is. The Bible tells us. We have the history. Read on in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so on, right? We know that Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to? Israel, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And God makes a covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, put your thinking caps on here. Where did God make the covenant with Israel? 
Mount Sinai, right? That's where he gave the law in Exodus 19. And he said, if you keep my law and my commandments and my statutes, you keep them all, then you, Israel, will be my special people. You'll be a holy nation. You'll be a kingdom of priests if you keep the law. That's the covenant that flowed from Isaac, right? Thank you. Walk through the Old Testament. That's it. Notice what Paul says. The one from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves, she's Hagar. If you don't understand why the Jews would be hopping mad at this, you don't understand what he just said. To this own day, to 2017, the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac hate one another. All the Arab-Israeli conflict in our own day stems back to the Arabs saying we are sons of Ishmael and the Jews saying we are sons of Isaac and they hate each other. Paul just said, Israel, under the law, unbelieving Israel, is from Hagar. He goes on. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, present for him. That's the Jews in his day. For she is in slavery with her children. Those are the biggest fighting words the Apostle Paul ever made. The Jews who are oppressing you, Galatians, the Jews who are leading you back to the law, they're sons of Hagar. They're enslaved just like their mother. They're sons of the bondwoman. Like I said, I would give anything to go back and see, listen to what was going on in that church as, they, as this was read. Well, that begs the question, that, well, well, wait a minute, what about Isaac? What about, we know the promise was to Isaac and to his son Jacob. What do we do with that? Well, what has Paul been teaching all through Galatians? Sons of Isaac? Oh, ha, I forgot, forgot some, sorry. Mount Sinai, we did that. Uh, Old Covenant. See, I'm going to come skip. The, I'm going to come back. The other line is the church. That's what he's saying. That's what he says in verse 28, right? And you, brethren, talking to the Galatians and their Gentiles, like Isaac, are children of promise. The promise to Isaac. Oop, over here. The promise here. That's to the church. And he says about the, about the church, this is the Jerusalem above. He says the Jerusalem of slavery is his present-day Jerusalem. The Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem, as the writer of Hebrews talks about, as Revelation 21 describes coming down out of heaven, that's the church. That's God's people. The covenant that, she, that, that Sarah represents is the new covenant. Now, I have Abraham uh, in parentheses there because it's the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled in the new covenant, but predominantly it's the new covenant as opposed to the old covenant, which was the law. This covenant was according to God's promise and according to the Spirit who makes us sons of Isaac, sons of Abraham, unlike the covenant, which was a covenant of flesh, according to the flesh, man's work. This was God's work. And he says, this produces children of freedom, not children of slaves. And then he says, verse 30, what does the scripture say we should do with the descendants of the bondwoman? Cast them out. Cast them out. For... The son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. 
Imagine reading this out loud in that congregation. Tell those Jews who are trying to bring you under the law, get out of Dodge. Because if that's your view, you will not be an heir with the sons of Sarah. Verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. You are not descendants of Isaac or Jacob, Abraham, through your family tree. You are Abraham's offspring through your faith tree. As my friend Blake likes to say, it's not about race, it's about grace. That's how you get in to the new covenant and receive the blessings promised to Abraham. And the Gentiles in Galatia who believed the gospel were genuine descendants, the real descendants of the promise of Abraham, and the Jews were cast out in God's sight. Whoo, fighting words, fighting words. Now, we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning looking at the origin of verse 27. I've been telling you in this class, and if you take my NCST classes and you have something to regurgitate, thank you, Amy, one of the things that you will, I've, I've had people say they get sick of my teaching, I've never heard anybody put regurgitate in the midst of it, but okay. One of the things that you will say and hear me say often is, you have to read the Old Testament like a Christian, not like a Jew. Paul is now reading the Old Testament like a Christian. Remember I told you in chapter 2, Paul spent about 10 years in the New Covenant School of Theology. I mean, you're only going to spend three or four years. He spent 10 years there at Jesus Seminary being taught by Jesus how to read the Old Testament as a pointer to him. Now he does that. He quotes, this quote here in verse 27 is from Isaiah chapter 54. He says, it is written, rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Clearly, in the context of what he, the point he's making, the barren woman is Sarah and the married woman is Hagar. Now, they were both married, but Hagar was married in the way that she was able to bear children. And he says, rejoice here, the barren one is going to have way more offspring than the other. Sarah's descendants are going to outnumber those of Hagar. That's how he uses it. But whenever the New Testament authors grab a quote from the Old Testament, they don't just grab one that happens to say what they want to hear. It's not confirmation bias. They don't think, oh, if only there was a verse. We do this, right? If there's just a verse that says what I want to say, boom, I'm going to quote it and grab it. I don't know what the context is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means you know, I can get this job. Read the context. That's not the point. It doesn't say you're going to get the job. It doesn't say you can lift a car. It doesn't say you can throw a football 100 yards. No, that's not what it means. In the context, that verse means I can endure all the trials that are brought to me through the strength Christ gives me. Don't just grab a verse. Not allowed to do that. Paul didn't do that. When he quotes this, he's not just thinking, oh, good, here's a a verse that has a barren woman and another woman, and she's going to have more sons. That applies. I'm going to quote it. He's got all of Isaiah in his mind. He just happens to quote one verse. But the, the Jews in the audience would have certainly known the context that he was quoting. Do we know the context that he's quoting? We're going to look at it. After today, you will know. Open your Bible, turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 52. I'm going to show you why Paul quotes this verse to make his point. And I'm going to show you how to read the Old Testament as a Christian and how to read the prophets as a Christian. Isaiah is called by many scholars the fifth gospel because he talks so much about the coming of the Messiah and the new covenant. So Isaiah 54, 1 is the verse that Paul quotes. But, now put your thinking caps back on, Isaiah 54 follows what chapter? Isaiah 53, good, you're brilliant, excellent. And Isaiah 53 follows Isaiah 52. You, got, you all could do this. Amy's right, everybody could teach. This is easy. 
So we're going to look at what Paul, what Paul, what Isaiah has to say to us, starting in Isaiah 52. This is Israel under the law. This is this Israel over here under the law, the law given at Mount Sinai, the old covenant. They're children of slavery. They are sinners, and they have broken the covenant, and God has brought a, an initial fulfillment of the curses that he promised, and now they're in exile. So there are a handful of people left in Jerusalem. Many of them are scattered throughout the, uh, the region of Babylon and, uh, and elsewhere, and they have received God's judgment. But whenever in the prophets God brings his judgment, there is always a pronouncement of hope. This is not the end of the story. And so that's what we find here in Isaiah 52. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. You're in chains now, but it's not going to end this way. Right? There's hope. For thus says the Lord... You were sold for nothing, <laughs> and you will be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to res reside there. Then the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now, therefore, what do I have here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause. Again, the Lord declares, those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking, here I am. And now he says something that should be familiar to you. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. In its original context, the deliverance, the salvation he's talking about, is rescue from the Assyrians and the Babylonians who've, who've exiled them. Right? That's the context. And the idea of the, the beautiful feet, we don't, we don't see this in our day because it's totally obsolete. But in that day, you would have watchmen up in towers, and their job was to watch, right? That's why they're called watchmen. They didn't get very creative with names there. They're watchmen. They'd give the towers, and they would watch, and there would be a runner coming with a report. And they learned, the watchmen learned to tell by the gait of the runner, by their running, by their style, whether or not they were bringing good news or bad news. If they were bringing bad news of defeat, they would run heavy and slow and kind of lumber on. But if they were bringing good news, if their nation was winning, if victory was close at hand, they would run very fast and alive. We're winning, we're winning. And so they'd look far off and they would see the runner coming and say, victory, deliverance, whatever. Well, that's what he says. How lovely on the feet are the feet of him who brings good news. When you look on the mountains, you see he's running cheerfully and happily and fast there's good news coming. And that's what God is saying. There's good news coming for Zion. He's going to deliver them. Now, do you remember how Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 10? It's in the context of the gospel. See, Paul reads the Old Testament like a Christian, not like a Jew. So going on. Break forth, this is verse 9, break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. This is going to be big. When he brings this deliverance, everybody's going to know about it. Depart. Depart, go out from there, touch nothing unclean, get out of the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of God, those who are going to carry the ark and so on, although the ark may be another story. But you will not go out in haste, nor will you go as fugitives, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant will prosper. Now, if you know how Isaiah talks about the servant, that should be a capital S talking about Jesus. But they didn't know this yet. 
my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, as many were astonished at you, Israelites, who were marred, who were, who were destroyed, so his appearance, the servant, was marred more than any other man. And his form more than the sons of men. Do you see what's being predicted here? Yeah, the cross. He's going to be beat up and bloodied. Thus, you remember what thus means? Or some of your translations say so. What does so mean? In this way, in this manner. What manner? The manner of being beat up and bloodied and marred. In this way, he will sprinkle many nations. With his own blood, he's going to sprinkle them and make them clean. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Now we have a chapter break here, but there's no break in the context. It continues on. Isaiah 53 follows Isaiah 52. So Isaiah 53, we all know this one. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. This is talking about the servant who would come. This is Jesus. He wasn't attractive. He wasn't kingly. Remember, he was like a meager lamb, a meek lamb. He was despised and forsaken of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And this is the one that just always gets me. And like one from whom men hide their face. This is the son of God and people are like, I don't even, he's so repulsive to me, I don't even look at him. And on the cross, that's exactly what he was like. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. Who's the one to put Christ on the cross? Ultimately, God did. But people are saying, yeah, God's judging him. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, his whipping, his beating, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Our sins transferred to Christ. Do you read this and just wonder, how could the Jews have missed this? How could they not have seen what the Messiah was coming to do? You remember when Jesus rebukes the disciples on the road to Emmaus? He says, you have read the law, right? You've read the Bible, you've read the prophets. How could you not know the Messiah had to suffer first? This is the longest chapter in the Old Testament dealing with the crucifixion. And it, because we know the truth, it seems as obvious as day. They missed him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of the people, of my people to whom the stroke was due? They didn't. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. That's Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased. That is Yahweh. That is God. Yahweh was pleased to crush him. It pleased the Father to crush the Son, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his, what? What? He will see his what? Say it loud. His offspring. 
Jesus, the Messiah, would see his sons. That's us. He would see it and be satisfied. Uh, he will see his offspring, he will proclaim his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper a- in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Jesus willingly went to the cross because he knew what he was doing. He knew he was buying our redemption and our salvation, and it was worth it to him. And he's satisfied with that. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Because he went to the cross, you and I stand here, sit here, righteous before God. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. End of chapter 53, but not end of the story. Chapter 54 is just a chapter break that men put in. God didn't put it in. He keeps going. And Paul reads this as a Christian, and he realizes God is not talking about national, political, ethnic Israel. Israel and delivering them, that's not his ultimate goal. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the faith sons of Abraham and of Jesus. Chapter 54. Shout for joy, O barren one. You who have borne no child, break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you have not tra- travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman. In this context, the barren women would not be women who were inherently unable to conceive. It would be women who weren't able to bear children because their husbands were slaughtered in the destruction of the city. They were barren because they didn't have husbands. But he says, you're going to have more children than those who currently do have children. Husbands. My pages keep moving. Shout for joy. Rejoice. And Paul says, that's the church. The real sons of Sarah are going to be more than there are stars in the sky. That's us. Now look, he goes on. So read this now as applying to you. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs, for you will spread out abroad to the right and to the left, and your seed will possess the nations and will resettle the desolate cities. This never happened for the nation of Israel. They came back to Jerusalem, but they were always small and enslaved. They had one little piece for a few years during the Maccabean revolt that they were independent. The rest of the time, from this point forward, they were enslaved. I always find it amazing when I read the Pharisees arguing with Jesus, and they say, we are descendants of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. And Jesus is like, "Um, Caesar? Confirmation bias. They interpret reality based on what they want to be true. They were always enslaved, but we need to build bigger cities, he says. We need to build bigger houses. This is why we care about filling the city, because the number of believers are going to continue to grow. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This is why we care about overseas missions. This is why we care about local outreach, because there are sons of Sarah waiting to be brought into the house. He says, build bigger houses. You're going to need them, because you're going to have a lot of sons. We need to be serious about evangelism. We have God's promise. People are going to come to faith. He goes on. Again, interpret this, read this as to you. Fear not. For you will not be put to shame. 
And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth, and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. How much shame do we deal with? Many of you know what I'm talking about. Because the enemy constantly wants to bring up past failures. And we've all got them. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to tell us lies. I mean, he does tell us lies, and we're dumb enough to believe him. But we've got enough truth in our past that he can shame us, and we let him. And we forget Jesus took our shame. What should we be ashamed of? Our sin. What happened to our sin? It was nailed to the cross. And when we let the devil make us feel ashamed, we don't believe the cross. Yes, I know, Jesus, that was humiliating for you and all, but you don't know what I did. And he goes, really? Yes, Jesus, I know you suffered horribly on that cross and God was angry with you because you had my sin, but I need to suffer a little bit of my own atoning work because I did some really bad stuff. And Jesus says, really? My sacrifice is not good enough to cover your shame? If we go down that path too far, we actually reject the gospel. Either, beloved, either... Jesus took the punishment for every single sin you've ever committed, or you will. He doesn't take some of the sin. He doesn't take the lesser sins, or the big ones, and leave you to take the lesser ones. He either takes it all, or you will. To put it very starkly, either he suffered the wrath of God like hell, on the cross, or you will for all eternity. Those are the only options. And if he took it, then stop being ashamed about it. It's done. It's done. Verse 5, for your husband is your maker. His name is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected. The God of the universe, the captain of the armies of heaven, took you and said, I want you to be my bride. Now, when I chose Krista to be my bride 25 and a half years ago, I picked her because she was gorgeous, and she made me really happy, and I was convinced that she would make me really happy for a really long time, and it was largely for me what I was going to get out of it, because I didn't have me as a premarital counselor, so I didn't know any better, and she has made me very happy for a long time, and she's still gorgeous. Amen? Okay, well... When God picked us as his wife, it wasn't because we were gorgeous. It wasn't because we were going to make him happy. It wasn't because he thought, hmm, if I partner up with them, this would be a great life. We were repulsive. We were nasty looking. We were rebellious. We made Hollywood look like a bunch of virgins which is pretty hard to do. And he said, I want you to be my wife. So why are you ashamed? I take you as my bride. This is why Paul, again, Paul reads the Old Testament as a Christian. He reads this, and in Ephesians 5 says, Therefore, husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church, because you represent Jesus. And wives, submit to your husbands like church does to Christ, because you represent the church. Together, God is our husband, and we collectively are the bride, and he calls us in. That's why we serve him. We should not be ashamed. He declares us righteous. He went to the cross to make us righteous, and now he's working to actually bring righteousness into our hearts and beings and lives. And he says, don't walk around ashamed. You're wearing a white dress. 
because I gave you a white dress. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. I'm not God, obviously, but for the most part, by God's grace, when my children disobey, I don't get angry. Occasionally I do, but mostly I don't. I do discipline them, and it hurts. It's not discipline if it doesn't hurt. The Bible tells us very clearly in both Testaments, discipline has to hurt to be disciplined. God disciplines his children. He disciplines his wife. But did you hear what he said? I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. When he's displeased with us, he disciplines us to correct us. But he never takes his child and beats him out of anger because he has sworn, I will not be angry at you. If you feel like the Lord is angry at you, you've forgotten the gospel. Now, he may be displeased with you. And my kids don't like when I'm displeased with them. And we don't like it when God's displeased with us, and we need to change our behavior to be sure. But his discipline is always love for his children. He says it here, I swore, I will never be angry at you. If there's a voice whispering in your head that God is angry with you, you can be certain that is not God's voice. There's another voice that wants to make you think God is angry. You know what my kids do when they know that I'm upset with them? They run and hide. What do you do when you feel like God is angry with you? You run and hide from the only place you can get help, which is God himself. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. That's the new covenant, beloved. The old covenant was not a covenant of peace. The, the old covenant created war between God and men. But the new covenant brings peace. This is the Hebrew word shalom. It means uh, a resting of hostility, but it means far more than that. It means God's blessing and his favor. That's the new covenant. That's who we are. That's what we have. That is the definition of the relationship that Jesus has with the church. Shalom. Peace. Compassion. Hope, love, forgiveness, blessing, favor. Not cast out, not a mediator, not walls to keep us out, not a temple where he sits inside and puts a veil up and says, you may not enter my presence. But that veil has been torn in two. He says, come to me. You're my bride. You're my children. And I love you. We're his church. We're his church. That's what Isaiah wrote about six centuries before Christ came on the scene. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we are still realizing the promises made to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. And the church is going to continue 
growing and growing because he has more sons waiting to be adopted into his family. We're going to be persecuted, not by the Jews necessarily. Right now, they don't have a lot of power in the world. But there are other slaves. There are other people who hate God's people. The book of Revelation talks about this. Satan hates you. He hates you with a passion. And he wants to destroy us, and he's going to attack us. And when he takes control of a government, and that government turns on God's people, it is, it is hard. And it's coming. It comes in every generation. And it's coming bigger down the road. But we are the bride of Christ. And at the end of it all, Jesus, our king and our husband, will come take us out of harm's way and he will destroy our enemy forever. And then it will be us and our husband, us and our father. Whichever metaphor you choose to camp on, us and Jesus Christ forever and ever in perfect joy and glory. It's about the church. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus and the church. And if you are a Christian today, that's you. Let's pray. Lord, make this real to us. Lord, don't let this stay in the head level. Don't let this stay a theology lesson, a, a hermeneutical lesson, a discussion of how Paul uses the Old Testament. No, no, no. You mean for us to be changed. You mean for us to feel loved by Jesus. You mean for us to be done with shame and humiliation and fear because we are married to the maker of the universe and he loves us and he has accepted us. He chose us when there was nothing good in us to choose. He chose us to be his bride. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself. Communicate to our hearts what it means that we are yours, that we are the church built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We are the eternal people of God in a covenant of shalom with you. And may you use us to bring other people into that covenant relationship with you where they too will be sons of Sarah, in whose name I pray.